Let's see. Did you make progress on the uh, the unit tests? Uh, uh, yes, I have actually created uh, tests for the routes, but uh, I have like one issue uh, which I want to show to you. Great. So uh, actually, the issue here is that so uh, when we actually create a model, uh, we uh, uh, we. Uh, create the context of it and we configure it. Mm -hmm. and also for the uh, scorer, we also create maybe we configure it and we also create a context for that also. But when we actually have to call the the score method, so in the score method we will have to actually pass both these labels so mm -hmm. that we can actually use the particular uh, model context and the async. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, so can you recap real quick? So when we create, I just want to make sure I'm getting all this in the notes. Um, so when we create the model, we create a context for the model and we create context for the source, right? Yeah. And then so we also... Actually, yes, so when we actually have to like uh, use a particular uh, model context on a particular uh, scorer context, we have to actually pass both of these labels in the, uh, in the API request. Yep. So yeah, so in the actual in the API.js, uh, there is only one uh, uh, this parameter called as this dot label. Okay. So in that label, I cannot send like two labels. Ah, okay. So let's just check that out here. So oh, like, wait, can I need I to share. share my screen to let you know. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So is it possible? Yep. Yeah, so uh, the problem uh, I was, uh, it was this problem. So we actually have to pass the, the model context label as well as we will have to pass the label for the scorer context. Uh, indeed, yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's see. But so label train, let's just see here for a second because it looks like when we train, okay, so let's look at how, you know, this, the, the model stuff used to work. So train takes just the model label and model takes just the model label. Um, so, mm, okay, yeah. Um, let's see, context model, label, CTX label. Uh, I think that it hits, I think it's because the, the data for the sources is in the post request um yes and i don't know i guess yeah okay and and part of that reason is because you know you might just throw the raw records in there with the scorer you're never gonna throw the raw records in there um let's see yeah um well so we could yeah so we could reference it by the label right um, or we could, um, or we could put it in the post body and the benefit of putting it in the post body is that we could maybe, you know, instantiate it if it doesn't exist, if we provide a config or something. Uh, but I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if we want to do that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess what, what do you think are the pros and cons of that? So in the score method, we have only this label. So we have probably need to have like one more. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> label. So let's see. We have. Score context. Yeah. Okay. So, but and then we have the body is the source context names. Um, source context that label. Uh, let's see. I thought. I swear. Wait a minute. Yeah, I swear that there was. I swear you could just post the data itself. Um, um, let's see. Like in the index.js file, the changes which I have made is this. So here, what we have, like, we are actually calling it from a context.score. Yeah. So 
okay so here like the ptx will have the knowledge like which uh, context we are actually calling uh huh <clears throat> but uh, for the for the testing which i was actually doing it was like it was not possible for me to do that. yeah because yeah we need to uh we need to add that the next um okay so you're saying this wasn't working So, so when I do it like this, uh, passing both the uh, labels, then it actually works. Okay. But, uh, but without this label, it actually doesn't. Work. And uh, working, I, I mean, like, yeah, like the the thing is, uh, the the model, which is the fake model, which is actually we are testing here. You know? So, uh, its accuracy method was actually. Just to count how many number of records were there in it. Uh-huh. So here we had like an accuracy method which was just counting the number of records we had, and it was just returning that value. Yeah. In the testing part, so that uh, there like we can test it. Uh, what was if it is getting the correct accuracy or not? But for my testing, I'm actually using an MSE scorer. Uh-huh. So for the MSE scorer, it actually doesn't uh, work for that because it tries to find a predict value, and uh, Oh, I see. So that's also one of the part, but but it gives the call to the scorer part, but actually it fails at that moment. Okay, and and it it fails because <clears throat> let's see, yeah, why does it fail? Oh, I guess it's just you and me today. Yeah, logging equals debug. So here it is actually failing because we do not have a config. Like they, we are actually using a base config which does not have a predict attribute. Which is basically like in this ah. it is to find if we have a predict or not. Ah, I see. Um, okay, so we probably need to be doing some in, some validation on the fact that it has yes, a predict have, method. Yes, we have to do like some real validation. Yeah, okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm thinking for... Yeah. Mm -hmm -hmm. So for the purposes, all right. So because we have the the okay. First, so so first off, um, uh, th is does it matter with the predict method what the results you're getting here are? Um, as far as MSC is concerned, I mean, can you just compare? Um, does it matter that you're going to get bogus? Um, you know, basically not real predictions from the fake model. I mean, because you still get predictions, right? So it's it's this. Can you just compare it, the MSE, to you know whatever it should be when you get the response? Uh, um, uh, what I was actually thinking, like maybe I can create like a fake accuracy score, which will uh, just mimic what actually was being done. Okay, that works. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good way to go. <laughs> Um, that way we keep the cr the structure consistent. Um, so, so now me... that the problem is with this, uh, we have to pass two labels. Yeah. So so uh, so need to pass model context label. Um, <clears throat> Uh, okay, yeah, I think, you know, I'm thinking about weighing the pros and cons of this whole thing, um, and I'm thinking, uh, okay, so, so here's, here's my thought process. We have all these URLs, will they take, you know, the, the main label of 
whatever the the thing that we're working with is right um so as what i'm realizing is we have the ability to instantiate um you know we have the ability to instantiate uh, uh you know base objects and then their contexts using those roots right um yes. so but and then but and then these these other API calls, they necessitate that we've instantiated a context. Um, now, the, there's the, the cons to this is that we can't instantiate a temporary object on the fly if we wanted to, um, because we're only passing the data in the URL. Um, and, and originally, you know, I, I, did, I built this trying to mimic the, mimic exactly the, um, the you know the python api right um, and we didn't have those high level functions at the time so yes. so now sort of getting i haven't looked at the http service in a long time you know um and and so this is giving me this new sort of this uh, a fresh look on it right and i'm thinking now that we're thinking about adding another label if it really makes sense to be using labels in the urls at all uh given that we have to post some data maybe we should just post um all you know all the data right um so um so yeah because then we could configure temporary sources models and and, and accuracy scores on the fly uh right um, we could provide their context or we can provide their whole config if the user wanted it, it you know just for that one operation uh this the, you know the the upside of this is that you you can have temporary objects the downside is um you the downside is that the body of the request becomes more complicated um which i don't think is a huge deal um but yeah i don't think that should be too big of a deal um so yeah i think i and and sort of looking forward in that perspective i think maybe we want to just include it in the body and then we'll go refactor the stuff later um to sort of not mix so much data between uh url and body does, okay. does that sound, you know, you, you, or does that, did my thought process make sense there? Uh, so uh, we are actually trying to put this uh, label and the, the configuration and the context in the post data itself. Yeah, that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking is, is, you know, look with, with, you know, coming back to this with a fresh set of eyes, uh, I am noticing, right, that, that we're, we're growing the amount of information in the URL, um, and maybe it didn't make sense to have that that information in the URL in the first place, right? So, so to head off the fact that we might refactor it, uh, let's just go ahead and include the label in the body of the request. Um, let's see. So, but but that does. Um, hmm. Okay. So yeah. All right. Okay. Now that does complicate your pull request further um, because. Yeah. We, yeah, that complicates your pull request server. So maybe we'll just add all of this to, you know, the list of things that will be done when we refactor, right? And and let's just get that A label working, right? Um, so let's, okay, so let me make a note that we're going to create an issue to track that. So let's create an issue to track um, uh, moving. Uh, data passed via URL parameters um, uh, the match info structure to the body of the post request. Sorry, I'm just typing. Um, so we'll we'll complete this later as a refactor. So, um, so what do I do now? So, let's take a look at that score. Or first, first off, we have a label and a label. Um, and and a label sort of makes it seem like uh, that's the score label. Uh, and the convention would be the score, um, you know, model and then model label. So score, and we'll want score label immediately after that. Um, so. Let's maybe do, you know, uh, M label or something, right? So we do the score label and then the model label. 
instead of A label, or uh, sorry, uh, first label and then M later label. All right, so this, the score label first, and then the next parameter would be the uh, model label, so M label, just for, for convention's sake. All right, cool. And then let's take a look at that score accuracy method. All right, so we have the model context in the, uh, so we have the at MCTX root uh, decorator on there. Um, and that's, yep, that'll add that model context. Um, and I believe we have, let's see, so get source context. Um, so I think what we'll want here is um, something well, i think i think do we have any roots where we're decorating with both i don't think we do um let's go up to mctx root and and look at that i think this is just going to be a case of copy pasting this and and creating an accuracy or an actx root uh decorator here so let's copy paste this method Oh, I see. Okay, I see what's going on. All right. Okay. Uh, now I understand. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So what we're going to need to do is uh, we'll just make this decorator a function itself. Um, so you know how like the op decorator, it can take parameters. Yeah. Parameterized yeah. Uh, yeah. Parameterized decorator. Yeah. So that's what we're going to do here. Um, so... Let's see. And we'll just make it, you know, an optional parameter. And that way we won't have to, uh, oh, let's see. Now we're, st ooh. yeah, I think, I think we did that within, yeah, that, that should work. Uh, cause I think we have an example of this one within op. Um, so let's go take a look at op. Cause I think, you know, we can, we can leverage some of the, the structure of this code here. Uh, DF of mel DF, DF of mel DF, and then uh, let's see, yeah, DF of mel DF uh, below config loader, or wait, not that. Uh, yeah, below config loader. Yeah, there we go. DB DF, and then I believe it's in base. Okay. Da, 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 da. All right, here we go. All right, so let's see. Yeah, so let's just scroll through this a little bit here. So I believe there was some stuff to say, you know, if there was no arguments or what was it? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, scroll down a little more. And yeah, keep going, keep going until we get to the main body of the function. All right, def wrap. Okay, so, all right, so here's the wrapper function. Um, keep scrolling to the end of this wrap function. All right, here we go. Oh, yep. All right, so yeah, so if there's any arguments, then we call... Okay, so if there's arguments to this function um, and no keyword arguments, then that means the decorator was called without. Uh, so we, we can basically have it be maintained. We won't have to change all those definitions of at MCTX to be calling the decorator. We can use the, you know, we can, we can call the decorator based on whether, um, um, whether the, it was passed any arguments or not, and then pass the uh, you know the label in the the, the keyword arguments. Uh, so because if if the the decorator itself will only ever be passed um, in in this case, since we're only using keyword arguments, we can uh, if we if there is any argument to the function uh, or to the decorator, we know that it's the function itself that's being wrapped. Uh, and if there's not any arguments to the function, then uh, and there's only keyword arguments, 
uh, since we're only using keyword arguments within the, the decorator function, then we can we know that um, we'll return the wrapper itself uh, because that that will be used to then wrap the function. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. We can we can we can go go through this. Do do. Okay. Yeah. I think. I mean. Do Do you want to do like a, a quick uh, run through of that, or does that make sense? Okay. So. Uh... Okay, so I will actually try how it works, and then I will I will get back to you. Okay, you get back to me. All right, cool. Yeah, so so and and yeah uh, yeah you'll you'll I mean you'll figure it out. Um, if you if you want a little example to to sort of distill this down to to slightly uh, more more clear uh, place, because I know op is a mess of a function, um, yeah. then just just ping me on Gitter and I'll I'll send you a little example code. Uh, sure, but, I'll let you know. Cool. Um, so let's see. Uh, will so you will modify MCTX uh, root to make it a. Uh, uh, let's see. Oops, I forgot to let everybody else in. Hey, sorry everyone. I I was not looking at the list of people who wanted to be let in. <laughs> I was like, wow, it's just Sutashu today. Um, all right, so we're gonna modify. Uh, the MCTX root to make it a um, uh, decorator that takes keyword arguments uh, similar to op. Uh, and then we'll copy paste the uh, MCTX or the yeah we'll copy paste the the MCTX roots method or decorator to uh, and modify it so that it's a ACTX uh, roots um, all right cool um and then modify it okay uh then we'll use the modified version so add label parameter to modified to uh, kwargs uh, mctx root um label keyword argument add so add label keyword argument to kw args mctx root uh, use in score uh, score accuracy was it what was the what was the root name of the root we've added score accuracy or let's see yeah score accuracy all right great uh, so are we good there and then so I've got a note to, to, to check the examples here and and if I don't do that by like you know end of tomorrow ping me because I have forgotten again so let's see sure. just keep just keep bugging me until it's yeah. <laughs> until it's done because I, I have yeah, I have a lot on my plate and this is something that I, I should be able to, to get quickly if I you know remember <laughs> to, to multiplex it in um, okay great is there anything else you want to talk about Sir uh, no that's it Thank all right great thanks all right, how's it going, guys? Yep, it's good. It's good. Finally, the meeting is started. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was early. I was thinking that that at eight thirty. I, I don't know what happened. I think I had another meeting on my calendar, and I got confused. Um, I had this big presentation yep. this morning. It was throwing me off. Um, but yes, now now we've started, and then I forgot to let you guys into the meeting because I was taking notes in the in the other window. All right. Um, so let's see. Uh, let me just go back. I feel like there was some stuff I wanted to follow up. Um, okay. So yeah, I still have Nitesh. I still have the the light light uh, GBM PR that I got to do the pinning. I think that you've been following that pinning discussion um, that's been going on, and just to update everyone on that. Uh, so this is this is basically the, the current blocker here on uh, on the release. So so Yash and I went through 
Uh, let me let me see what's going on with that. So, um, I can't I can't see your oh, you screen. Oh, you can see. All Please. right, great. Thank you. I always forget to represent when someone else shares. All right. All right. Um, so. Perfect. Great. I think I'm recording now. Yeah. Okay, great. So, I'll release. I'm gonna put this up here. Oh, and then I want to talk about GSOC. All right, so current blocker is essentially, um, so we did a lot of work to put stuff in the requirements.txt files. Um, and and that was that was because uh, we need to scan. So I got I have to do as part of some compliance. I have to do scanning for vulnerabilities. Um, and so you guys might have seen SNCC. It's just this public tool that we use to scan. Um, we also use the public Coverity to scan. Um, and so so essentially, what happened is that SNCC requires the requirements being requirements.txt files uh, to to be able to scan them. And then when I scanned it, I was like, I know it's going to create issues, uh, but great, I have to do all this work anyways. So uh, we scanned it, it found issues, most of them were with TensorFlow, so the, essentially the remediation here is, is upgraded TensorFlow 2.4, uh, that, and all of this is described in this issue too, so I'm not going to take notes on it, but um, so... So upgraded TensorFlow 2.4. So we went to upgrade to TensorFlow 2.4 and found out that um, the this breaks the NLP transformers um, module uh, that Himachu uh, wrote for us. So uh, because there was some API break, basically when you go from 2.3 to 2.4, uh, transformers needs to be upgraded to a, uh, a like 3.4. 5.1, um, and despite it being a minor version change, uh, it's got API breaking changes. I think we talked about version numbering schemes in a different recording, so I'm not going to go over that again. Um, but let's see, make sure we got everybody. Um, so yeah, so essentially, what what happened is this also ties into something that's happening in the Python e packaging ecosystem. There's some, um, a few uh, Python enhancement proposals called PEPs, um, and these are basically how Python works. Um, so if you're ever curious about, you know, some core Python functionality, uh, you're going to go check the PEPs on their on their website. Um, and I think we have links here. Yeah. So for example, uh, they're trying to get away from using uh, setup tools, which is is you know the backbone of those setup.py files and what was for a long time the python packaging uh, ecosystem uh, because we would build what are called eggs and i think they were supposed to be like you know everything is 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 a play on words with python so they're like python eggs uh, i googled for that and i was disappointed to see snake eggs all over the page um, i i sometimes forget that not everybody is programming um so Anyways, now we're trying to build wheels, um, and the, and the main motivation for this is wheels are uh, like they're essentially a zip file where they're similar to to the eggs, but they get structured and, and used differently, um, and they support binary you know binary compilations. And if you guys are familiar with Conda, um, you know Conda became this place to uh, host all your binary packages um, because there was there's ways that things get compiled. Um, it's, it's hard to distribute comp compiled packages that work on many systems um, because there's various, you know, when, when you're compiling something, you have to be compatible with, you know, various versions of the, the C library, which is pretty much included everywhere. And, uh, you know, various other libraries that are going to be present on the system and, and different systems have different versions of things. So you switch from Debian to Ubuntu to Fedora, you might have incompatibilities. And Conda solved a lot of that by, by providing those libraries in a nicely uh, packaged way that's, that's consistent um, from my understanding. Uh, so eventually, um, the Python ecosystem and their support for compiled packages and, and helping the, the package maintainers compile those better has matured. And they came up with this thing called the mini Linux wheel uh, format. And so mini Linux basically says, uh, 
if you compile using these specific you know environment and settings then stuff is going to work back to like centos 6 uh, which centos 6 is a, a very widely supported enterprise enterprise uh version of linux um so uh, and if you guys aren't familiar with centos it's a uh, basically the free version of red hat enterprise linux um so a lot of companies use that when they don't want to pay red hat um so that was chosen as as the place to support um, I just kind of want to give you guys some background because as you do more Python stuff and packaging, you're going to be uh, having headaches about this. So um, anyways, we're trying to move away from setup tools. We've got wheels, compiled packages, you know, wheels support compiled packages. There's lots of machine learning stuff that's compiled. And as we've grown more and more into machine learning, we get more and more compiled packages because we need performance, um, you know, and underlying hardware features to get this, this you know, the, the parallel processing that's required. Uh, and so enter, enter this uh, PEP 517 um, because setup tools does a really bad, if you've ever tried to make a compiled package, you will find out that it is a huge pain in the ass um, because setup tools, basically you'll run into this problem where uh, you may try to import dependencies uh, within the setup.py file that are required to to compile your code. So for example, if you're using Cython, if you guys have seen Cython, it's a it's a binding generator um, from, it'll, it'll take these PYX files, which are a mix of C and Python syntax and generate uh, uh, pure C code using the Python APIs. Um, and so things like Cython re will require that you import them in your setup.py file, but your setup.py file will require that you have uh, Cython, you know, you have to list it in this field called setup requires. So now you have this, uh, or like, you know, chicken and egg, or in this case, Python and egg problem, uh, where, you know, you, you don't know what the setup file is going to import until you import it. And so it's going to fail as soon as you import it. Uh, and this is why like some modules like profit and other things will say, Hey, you have to install Cython before I think stands is a good example of this you have to install cython you have to pip install this before you pip install our package so there was different build systems other than setup tools introduced like this one calls uh fillet um and uh or fillet i'm not sure um and so basically to we need this non-python format so they they're using the pi project toml file to now define basically you know what 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 are the packages that you're gonna that you're going to need before i run the setup py file or to build this project um and so essentially this yeah so this format um this format is sort of like the new the newer format right um and it's the format that we have to move to eventually. Um, so we're basically going to take the opportunity to move to this format now. And and the main reason was in the way we were combining uh, setup.py and requirements.txt was we would read in the requirements.txt file uh, into setup.py um, and then we then because we used to statically declare the dependencies as an array within the install requires variable um, now the problem is when we went to go pin all of these dependencies uh, because you guys remember we did the 3.7 release there were issues with tensorflow um, and so the versions mismatch for a while there was NumPy and TensorFlow had incompatible versions. Um, and so for a while, the, the release packages were broken uh, because, you know, the user would install the package. It would install the latest version of all these packages because we have, you know, basically equals to or greater on all the package versions. Um, and then, you know, their, their install would break uh, because the API changes were incompatible. Um, so to combat this, there are these things called environment markers, which you can specify in your requirements.txt file. Um, and they end up looking like, uh, let's see, I think I have this branch here. So, uh, okay. So they end up, sorry, I know this is a lot of background, but the, the deeper you go into, into, into Python stuff, the more this becomes applicable. So you'll, you'll probably care about this at some point, um, if not now. Um, so let's see, yeah, where did it go? Um, 
Uh, what was it? Oh yeah, so these environment markers. Um, I don't think we have an example in this one. I think the one that we cared about was, uh, okay. Let's just do a two and a two. Or where's RPM? Or yes, CV bin tool. That's one of these. Uh, all right. So just to show you an example here. So you can say if the version of Python, for example, is greater than 3.4, import, then install this module. Um, and so this is useful, especially for things like, uh, so this is useful, for example, if you want to dynamically support new functionality, if the dependency supports that Python version, or if you're using backported packages. Um, and this is going to be something that we run into shortly here that you guys will see. Uh, but there's this package, so import lib metadata. Uh, so this is a package that was introduced in Python 3.9 or yeah 3.8 i think and since we're our minimum version supported is 3.7 we're going to eventually switch to using uh this uh import lib metadata package but because it's not let's see because it's not um it doesn't exist let's see yeah it doesn't exist within 3.7 but it does resist in 3.8. When we do the import call, it's going to fail unless we install this third-party package on PyPy that was, you know, released to to support older versions of Python that it hadn't been added to the standard library yet. So we're going to add a line like this that says, "Hey, if the Python version is less than 3.8, then you need to install import lib metadata." Uh, and the other thing that this comes into play for is as we're pinning these versions. Uh, what we noticed is as we pin different versions across platforms, so like Linux, Mac, Windows, uh, you'll end up with different versions being required on different platforms. So when we go to pin, this requirements.txt file becomes all equals equals whatever was installed in the CN CI environment, right? And so this is going to ensure that the users always get a reproducible install, right? And so they always get this environment where all these machine learning packages work together, which is our goal. Um, and so the problem was that we can't, uh, we we can't, um, we can't define these version markers in the requirements that are in setup.py install requires. So it's supported by requirements.txt if you use that with pip. And some of them are supported in uh, setup.py if you list them within the, you know, the array of dependencies with their versions, but not all of them, specifically not the one that's related to the platform system, which, which says install this if you're on this specific system. Now it is supported in, like I said, in requirements.txt and in this new PEP 17 format, um, which, which leverages this, there's another part of it, which is the setup.config file. So our options are essentially, um, you know, yeah, our options is essentially move to this new format, um, which supports the version, the environment markers, which we now require to pin the dependencies on across platforms. Um, that was an incredibly long explanation, but uh, this is, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very annoying. So uh, that's, that's the gist of it. Um, and I felt like it was kind of hard to explain in an issue. So I wanted to make sure that there was enough background for everyone. Um, also, because yeah, packaging and, and Python is, you know, important and uh, it's good, good to, good to have background. Um, anyways, any, any, I'm sure you guys don't want to hear me talk more about this, but any questions on this? All right, cool. Um, great. So that's the current blocker on release. Um, and um, yeah, I think we just wanted to cover that. Did, how did we get on that? Um, yeah, we were talking about Oh, I needed to get back to you on the light GBM. So that that's basically, we're going to wait until after release to do this, I think, or maybe I'll do it after that issue. Um, and we'll see. We'll just see how it goes. Uh, it shouldn't be do too much work to do after that issue is solved. Um, we could get it in the release. All right. Um, anyways, so uh, let's get back to you, Nitesh. Um, uh, so what, what did you want to talk about other than that that you had, investigated the uh um some source stuff right 
Yep, yep. I'm working on a HDF5 source. Great. And so I, I just followed the SQLite, uh, the, the example of SQLite in the tutorial. Uh, and there is some issue while running the test case. So I wanted to show, uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. Okay. Yep. Mm, it's coming. Where is it? All right, great. Is it visible? Is it, yep. is it visible? Yep. Okay. So that's the file structure. Uh, so basically, DIR is like a group, and inside a group, feature, key, and prediction. These three are the data sets mm. that uh, are stored in the SDF file. So users have to just pass uh, that group name that is the dir right mm -hmm. just a file so the config file config contains the file name and then group mm -hmm. and uh, uh, this is the a enter where uh, i have to open the file and then uh, go uh, browse to the particular group name and then in exit we i just need to close it and there is record records function and this function converts the uh, the values into the record, right? Okay. So I think I'm I'm missing something to make a key. There is some kind of. Uh, oh yeah. That? So it's I like think yeah. a data type. There, there, there is a, some kind of data type error. Maybe I'm passing a wrong. Data features uh, equals. Oh uh, yeah, you wanna you wanna get rid of that key. So basically, your modified record structure here. Mm -hmm um yes you that's the structure yeah so you need i think so data you see data equals modified record data oh wait um modified record key wait a minute okay what's the error what what was the error that you're getting uh, or oh i see i think i see what's going on um this. okay I think uh, that, none type is i think is not i think this is because we didn't return self from a enter um this specific issue mm -hmm. yes. um, a enter okay i need to return a self right mm -hmm. here uh yeah and that's and this is so anytime you have an a enter or an enter method you need to return self because when you're saying as uh that's basically saying okay whatever the return value was is now this uh yep. the, yep, the yep, source yep, context so yeah all right um source context has mem. yeah okay so and i think this is probably a holdover from the the fact that this is no longer a subclass of memory memory context um so let's see yeah, I think yeah that that method just will need to be um, converted there into uh, you know to modify the the the, the HDF5 file directly. Yeah. Okay. Does that make yeah just like you're reading from it directly, right? Because you weren't putting those in mem. Yeah, you you know you're reading from the file directly in records and record, um, and so you're you're going to want to to write to the file directly rather than than how you because you converted this from the, uh, the the file source example which was backed by memory, um, and so now you're just not backing it with memory you're backing it just with a flat file through the HDF5 interface, um, and so you're going to want to use the HDF5 interface to to modify the file directly. Yes. 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 So right now I'm I'm not developing a update function, so I think yeah. it should be commented. Cool. Uh, so uh, I think so you do need to implement it though, or else it's going to raise a uh, uh, you know a, a problem okay. with the with the abstract base class. So that's that's what I have developed. It's it's a right way to go. I think yes, this looks because... great. So I am a little concerned about you know uh, I think the only thing here that I would I would recommend is this features prediction key um, that 
you know, will mean that that our data, you know, that HDF5 file must have those things within the group, right? Yes. Um, and yeah, and that this particular thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so that by by doing that, we're you know um, we're 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 uh, sort of boxing in the user to to needing to name their HDF5 files like that, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. So so and I think we need to one we need to like like I said, you know, we, we probably want to look at a few examples of HDF5 files out there um, to have some some data to back, you know, whatever decision that we make here, um, because I'm, I'm sure that those aren't going to be, you know, standard, right? Uh, that structure or that structure may be standard, but those keys might not, may not be, right? Um, so let's, at, at a minimum, we need to make those keys configurable. Uh, the features prediction and key, you know, we need to make those configurable variables. Maybe we default them to those values, uh, but we need to allow the user to overwrite them. Um, and uh, then, then we also need to do some more looking into, you know, making sure that, um, uh, yeah, we need to make sure that that some example files out there, maybe some popular data sets, really, really do follow this this format. Um, and I think you said that, you know, this is basically just how it works. But you know, we want to, we need some, we need some kind of some kind of uh, uh, hard data on that, just uh, just just to be sure, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think you had an example somewhere at some point. So, you know, we just just one data set, and and I think, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure we we yeah. settled on the yeah, fact I, that that's I, what I, it is, right? I have I have created a SDF five data set, uh, which follows this particular uh, format, mm -hmm. right, for testing. Okay. Cool. As an example. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then, I mean, so I'm just saying, like, if we can just have, like, one link to a data set that we could point to, that's, a, that's you know, a public data set, maybe in this format, then we can, uh, then we can, we can make sure that, that that's, you know, the way other people are doing it. Um, um, I, I mean, I think that, okay. that it sounds, it sounds like it's standard, right? But uh, I feel like we ran into something like this before, um, where, where we, I can't remember what it was. Um, it may have been when we did like the, well, with the IDX source, we had, yeah, with the IDX source, it's basically the NIST data. Um, but, you know, we had we had that file and it, it was the example file, right? And it's just good to have a specific data set, um, you know, that uses that format as like a live data set, just so, just to make sure that we're, we're in tune with, with the rest of the community, right? Yeah, because um, people do wacky stuff. All right, um, let's see. Uh, let me just write that stuff down here. Uh, and, and you don't have to make a test case with the link. I just, you know, I just we just need to. I would like it would be good to have on hand in case somebody asks us for a reasoning, right? Because uh, we we need to have documentation on what, on why we make decisions. Okay, so follow. Uh, it would be good to have a link to some data set that uh, uses this. I mean, yeah, it sounds like this is going to be the very standard way of doing it, <laughs> but just to be, you know, just in case. All right, so it would be good to have a link to some data set that uses this type of uh, format. Because um, is there a possibility that you wouldn't have the directory? Did you say, mm. or does it always have the directory? So the group, I mean. Yep, like, yep. It's it's a group. It may be possible that a user don't create a group. It just uh, created a SDF five file and then just put it the feature. Uh, feature is like an NumPy array and prediction keys. All these things are a NumPy array. So is it possible that user may create this kind of format? Okay. That, uh, there is there is no group. So in that case, I just need to browse uh, from the home directory of the SCF file. Cool. Yeah. So we'll just make group optional too then. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're going to make group optional. We're going to make features prediction and key optional. Uh, uh, with their same names as their default value. Uh, 
Uh, and then let's see. So then uh, the way you made that file, is that within code within the test cases? Did you dynamically create the file um, and include the, yep. the code to create it within the test cases? OK, great. Uh, then we're good there. Um, yeah, I think this looks great. Uh, and then the only other thing is that that read mode. I think we need to go from camel case to, to underscore. Um, oh, okay. That's Nick case. Cool. Yep. Um, all right. Sweet. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, no. All right. Great. And actually, I have I have also started working on H uh, that model. What's H two O auto ML? So. Oh, awesome. I think. Yep. Yep. Uh, because I have work on it, so it, it will be easy for me. So I just started. Nice. Uh, maybe maybe next week uh, I will make a pull request. For All that. right, very cool. Yeah. yeah we have quite so, the quite the library of models now. Um, so. Yep, yep. Yeah, that is true. Auto that's, and all looks cool. That's that's it from my side. All right, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks. Thanks. All right, Saksham, how have you been? Uh, hey, John, I've been great. How how are you? All right, yes, I've been I've been good. Um, let's see. Uh, right. So yeah, I looked into the things we talked about last week. Yeah. And uh, what you just sent me on Gator was what we talked about. That that was the Python API stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the Dercom stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is that this works only in the config loaders object. Only in the when we do uh, when when we do uh, yeah. config loaders dot load underscore file, mm -hmm. and in data flow run we have uh, the code written is uh, loader dot load b, so it's just using the load b function. All right, and not going through the Durconf uh, code you've written. All right. In config loader. All right, no, uh, yep. in yeah, BFFML yeah. and <laughs> yeah, my bad. No worries. No worries. I should have done that. All right, let's see. So you said yeah, so, it's doing load B? Uh, so the load B function is uh, like, it's in the JSON YAML and everywhere that we have used that when we write a new config loader, then we write a new load before them, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and I think this is probably just because this was before we wrote the data flow stuff, before we wrote the config loaders class. Yeah, we just need to change that. Yeah, we just use config loaders. And I think, I think, you know, I think was it Ogden that implemented that? I think he, you know, he threw this somewhere else. So there's got it. I know there's another. Let's see, config loaders. Um, so let's just copy. I was looking at this stuff and I was like, why is the image stuff showing up in the config loaders <laughs> and not this? And then I saw that in the image stuff, I use the new config loaders and everything in the uh, source directory. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um. Let's see, config loader, config loader. Uh, OK, source. Yeah, OK. Uh, where was I think there was more CLI stuff. Yeah, OK, we have it in util CLI command. Um, so let's see. Hmm, and you know, we have it here. Um, I'm thinking that this is already instantiated within the command before we call the run function, isn't it? Let's see. Where was it? Oh, it's in parse unknown, I think. Yeah, here we go. So parse args, and then we do parse unknown, and we pass the config loaders object. So we already have a config loaders instance instantiated, and I think it makes sense to definitely keep this alive for the lifetime of a CLI command, right? Um, yeah. So I think maybe we just go ahead and uh, I think we should probably just go ahead and uh, um, let's see. We have. A, da, 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 instantiate the class. Yeah, we instantiate. Wait, uh, command do run. Do run is the class method. And where was the class? So command equals class. Yeah, I mean, I think let's just go ahead and 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 assign. You know, 
config loaders as a as a as a you know a a, a local object. yeah a class class local variable right um so yeah. you know args dot we can even just do like args dot command dot config loaders equals you know config loaders uh and and then well i think you know probably the correct way to do this is to is to uh, override the a inter method of command here yeah i think oh okay we have a, a inter method um so let maybe we 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 just throw it in here That's and then good. we do it at a exit yeah uh oh wait no because this is before we've instantiated it um so we may just need to bump this stuff you know one level of indentation in and then assign you know before we call this right so maybe assign you know right after line 222 and indent this whole block right um it's you know that's that's a bit hackish um but uh i don't uh, properly get okay. what you're trying so to i'm say. saying i'm saying let's see Oh yeah, great. Search for config. Why don't you? Everything is named config. All right, so yeah, we bump this in, and we just say um, command equals. All right, so instantiate the class, instantiate the CLI class. Right, so this is you know whatever whatever CLI command. So basically this is a class method, right? And so we're creating an instance of whatever class was um, desired. So in this case, DFML CLI data flow, um, you know, uh, let's see, what, what are we doing here? Where's the big letters? Or wait, where did that, go? oh yeah. Okay. I see, I see. Oh yeah. Okay, yeah, base config loader, config loader. Yeah, so we specify the config loader. Uh, was that what was going on? Let's see. So config loader. Yeah, okay. So now we just modify, you know, this would be config loaders. It's already instantiated. Um, I can't, like, like, we just need to change it to use uh, the config loaders interface, right? Because I think we do uh, base config. So um, does this change need to be in the whole code, right? I think this is the only place where we're using, um, let's see. I think this is the only place. In the, we're using it in run two, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, throughout this data flow that file, right? Yeah, CLI data flow will need to be modified here. Um, but okay. I don't think you're going to, you know, eh, we may see some, some, yeah, you know, I don't think we're going to have massive changes to the files because the, the, the level of indentation here that's relevant is basically, you know, like, these four lines here is probably going to change to a different level of indentation. I think it's going to be pretty minimal file changes. I believe we can still specify. So config loaders, um, util config. Or... Yeah, I understand it. Okay, cool. Great. Um, I just want to make sure the method, okay, load file. Okay, this takes a file path. Um, so... I think, okay, so the difference here, I believe, is going to be that this looks at the files extension. We have a lot of examples that pipe um, and, and look at dev standard in. Um, so we may want to, um, let's see. Yeah, we may want to go here and, uh, let's see, load file. We may need to basically add the ability to, like, specify the extension or something there's load single file yeah i think i think we're going to need to sort of like implement support for what if there's no extension on the file and you know provide a a, a parameter that says um you know if so if, if we are looking at dev standard in for example baster is going to be current working directory or i guess it already probably defaults to that doesn't it um or does it baster equals baster um load file yeah load file baster uh baster baster uh, 
let's see, let's single file. Yeah, well, you get the picture. You know, you're gonna have to modify this to support Dev Standard in, and, and you're probably gonna hit, <laughs> you're probably gonna hit issues with that right away with the test. So um, yeah, I'll work on this and cool. I'll, you can, uh, can you create an issue for this? Yeah, let's create an issue. So um, let me just flip back to. Uh, uh, where's that? It'll be easier to track this and yeah, just write uh, the things that are coming along the way. All right. So, uh, you guys played with this GitHub command line tool that they wrote in Go? It's pretty nifty. So, we're talking about essentially um, util command CLI. Um, and config loaders or well let's just say this is more of a CLI data flow uh, modify to use config loaders class instead of base config loader um, current so currently uh, we specify or uh, support uh, piping, or currently we specify uh, config loader, loader format uh, and, or do auto detection via file type. Um, within the um, the uh, data flow CLI slash data flow and uh, so let's see uh, let's modify um, uh, util or command from util CLI uh, to add the config loaders instance, it creates um, to the uh, properties or as a property of the object, uh, the instantiated uh, CLI or command object um, then uh, refactor uh, data flow code to uh, use that added property and um, make sure uh, taking input from stddn or dev STDN still works. All right, great. Uh, do you think that accurately describes what we're doing here? Yeah, yes, that's perfect. All right, great. I want to make sure that we don't, that we have enough, uh, enough info here. So, oh, okay. It's, yeah, it's, I've noticed it has, uh, <laughs> it has a little bit of a, a weird UI thing to the GitHub command line tool since they did an update on it. Um, all right, this is important. Still new. Yeah. Let's see. And let's let's just go ahead and target the next release. Uh, just you know, just no pressure. So the next release will be zero point five. Uh, so I think you know what what I do just to re recap on this because I think I've explained it at one point, but um, a long time ago. Uh, basically, the the way that I was doing the. Uh, like the project management of this is essentially as we get close, what we want to do is we want to have this defined release schedule of like, you know, ideally shoot for every two weeks. Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, I got bogged down in compliance stuff and, and then recently they simplified the compliance process. So now I'm sort of unblocked on that. Um, and, and so we're, we're ready to go pending, you know, this, this less, you know, our main pinning issue thing. Um, uh, so so then what we do is basically we, I try to get you know all the things that we think we can get done in and tag them on that milestone and then as we go to the next release uh, you know that we're gonna have a, a 
four point X series, right? Before we get to 5.0, uh, I think 5.0 is just what we're going to call the beta one. So I've been trying to basically label things, you know, based on how far out I think we're going to accomplish them, or you know what we think needs to get accomplished sooner. So some things are tagged 1.0, most things are tagged uh, 0.5, um, and then as we do this next release, we're going to think about you know the next two week cycle and what everybody's working on, and we're going to create a new uh 0.4.1 milestone and we're going to start thinking about uh you know which which issues we can we want to tag for that milestone and try to be working to get done before that 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 release and we're just going to try to stay on that cycle now that now that this compliance process is is faster um so that's does that make sense uh, yes, yes all right cool great um yeah um Awesome. I mistook that. I thought that we were just jumping on to 0.5. Yeah, it's more of a, a staging thing, right? Sort of like, you know, we'd like to get all these things done by then, but, uh, you know, we don't we don't know exactly what we're going to prioritize until we get through this, uh, you know, this next release. So then we start looking. We pick at that as our, like, staging list. At least at least that's how I'm thinking, you know. I th It's been pretty successful, I think, for the past few releases. So, uh, obviously, this release has been a, a, a large debacle, you know, on, on my part because of this compliance struggle. Um, but, but luckily, things are, are smooth sailing now, it seems like, knock on wood. All right. Okay, so would yeah, and I'm gonna work to get this painting thing done. So, and then we can we can throw that out the door. All right. Well, anything else from anyone? Uh, let's see. And then let me make sure that we get this issue in the, in the body here. All right. Well, thank you guys. And I, uh, oh, and oh, wait, there is one last thing. I put it at the top. I almost forgot it. Uh, so GSOC 2021, um, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the, the, the project list ideas. Um, Saksham, I was wondering, I was, uh, I think I have, I, yeah, I wanted to talk to you one-on-one uh, -on -one sometime. Uh, I think I can't remember if I hit send on that message or not. Um, uh, yeah, you did hit. Okay, uh, great. I don't think you hit send on another message. <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll figure out a time to do that. And uh, yeah, if you'd be interested in uh, helping mentor this uh, this year, that would be awesome. Uh, we can just talk more. Yeah, about I was. I wanted to talk to you about the same thing. I'm Great. glad that you're on the same page already. All right, cool. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, let's let's see if we can do that. Um, and uh, let's see. So yeah, hyperparameter tuning, preprocessing, uh, Juniper notebooks, for examples. Um, so we want to we want to try to get those things done. Um, and that sounds that sounds good. All right, cool. Um, and then anybody who has, so these are, th or these are possible projects, uh, that Yash and I brainstormed. Um, so if you guys have any project ideas, possible project ideas, you know, go ahead and post them as an issue, um, or add them, you know, to just, you can run them by me. I um, think we should focus more on, uh, fixing everything up and adding uh, other pre-processing and stuff uh, yeah. or, or rather than adding models. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Um, so, and then, and let's see. Well, so, so a documentation, can we do a documentation project? Uh, we cannot. Is, I, I looked is at that not last. In the scope of yeah. This? Yeah. So it, I don't believe that's within scope. Um, now, now that, now I think there's a bit of, yeah, I don't, it's not in scope, which is unfortunate because obviously, you know, our documentation is, is heavily code based, right? You know, there's <laughs> the documentation involves a lot of programming to get it all right. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. But I think, I think they, you know, yeah, I think, I think it might be a no. Um, so I think let's, let's try to stay away from that. Although, you know, with the way that we have things structured, I think we're in a space where we can pretty easily turn a lot of, you know, maybe examples, we can work on examples, um, and then pretty easily turn those into docs. Um, so let's see, um, let's try to stay away from adding models. Uh, models as a part of GSOC. Go with web UI. Yo, yeah, the oh, web UI, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Now the web UI, I think, is the web UI is well. You know, last year CVE Ben Tool had a project where one of the students did a web UI, um, and I think we'd stayed away from that last year because 
uh, well, we're part of the Python, right? Um, but you know, Terry Terry uh, runs Python org, and she runs CV Ben Tool. So if, if you know a, a, a student uh, on her on her team did a, a, a web UI uh, that was mostly you know JavaScript and HTML, I think that means we're probably in the clear. So I think yeah, we can put that one on the docket too. Um, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, because there is you know there is. Uh, I think you know I, I got a, I got a, a pretty good way into this. There's obviously I'm I'm not incredibly uh, fluent in React, um, but you know there's definitely a base to start from here. Um, so, all right, and uh, yeah, anything else? Just just let me know. We can we can try to post those. So, cool. All right. Well, thanks thanks everyone, and uh, you know just ping me. Uh, <laughs> to make sure you bug me if I owe you something um, because uh, I. Uh, obviously, have many, 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 uh, many irons in the fire right now. So I've got hard to juggle things and remember. So especially, you know, quick stuff. You know, I want to make sure that that I can I can help on block. Right. Cool. All right. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Yep. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Yeah, thank you.